Hello. Today I want to talk about the idea of language in use as a phrase to describe the term discourse. Uh, if you use the word language, if you talk about language analysis, people will sometimes focus on uh, nouns and verbs, uh, grammatical categories like that. Whereas when we talk about discourse or language in use, we talk about explaining language beyond just our knowledge of grammar, language as it is used in the real world between people for real purposes, unlike the contrived examples that we often get in textbooks when they're explaining how particular grammatical points work. Uh, when we really do use language, we use it written or spoken to talk to people, uh, to communicate messages, and so we have to take more factors into account than just the, the grammatical positioning of the words, which is of course important, which is you know how we start learning language in, in primary school, but as we move on we try to take more account of the in-use part of understanding how language works. Uh, an example is uh, here some years ago when I first moved to Britain and I'm uh, in the university hallway and I see two students talking to one another and one of them says to the other something like, uh, and, and here I'm listening in because that's what I do, right? Uh, eavesdrop on people. I think all good linguists do that. Uh, even people who are not linguists who do that are probably thinking sometimes about the content but other times about how things are said, right? And that's what I was doing here. One student says to the other, you got an iPhone, you cow. And at the time, this really surprised me to hear one call the other one a cow. Uh, it looked quite, uh, it sounded rather quite rude, right? Uh, I don't think in North America or in Canada where I'm from, cow is used in the same way as it is here. So for someone to call the other one a cow seemed quite uh, surprising, especially because they seem to be from earlier in the conversation, I mean, it's not like I listened for a long time, but earlier in the few sentences I heard, they seemed to be getting along quite well. And then one says, you got an iPhone, you cow. And, uh, you know, the cow, the, it, these are important terms here, right? The denotation of cow, cow denotes this, right? A, a four-legged bovine farm animal is the denotation of cow. And uh, cow could be also like this, right? Whether it's a real cow or a, 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 well, the other one wasn't real in the sense that it was a photograph of a real cow, though, and pictures of cows and sort of humanoid cows. Uh, there's the denotation of cow centers on that, right? The bovine, four legged farm animal. And it was pretty obvious that she wasn't calling her that, right? That student A, let's say, wasn't calling student B that because she clearly wasn't she was clearly human so then i start thinking about the connotations of cow right and what are the connotations of cow uh the generally for many of us this will be culturally different the connotations right but for many of us uh and and you know here the connotations of cow are, are not very good right um probably cows are associated with slowness with lack of intelligence perhaps dirtiness uh, the size, right, you know, overly large. And so then I started thinking, well, is she referring to the connotations of cow, which of course, that's a metaphor, right? When you don't, when you use the word not to refer to the denotation, farm animal, but to the connotations of stupid, lazy. But of course, the reaction would tell us how student B took it. If she got insulted and said, what are you talking about? And they got into an argument. Then I'd get a feeling that, aha, she was using the connotations of cow and it was an insult. But of course, that's not what happened, right? Uh, they're, they're friends, obviously, they're smiling, they're laughing, the body language is, is uh, suitable to the rest of the interaction, right? There's no aggressiveness or anything, no no giving the, giving the finger or anything. So uh, I had to see that the 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 one called a cow said just said something oh my family got a plan and uh, 
uh, it included new phones, and so that's why I have this new top-end iPhone. So she obviously didn't take offense. So cow can't have meant the denotation uh, farm animal. It can't have even really meant the connotation, you know, lazy, stupid, whatever. Um, they just walked off and said, see you later, right? See you later. Yeah, no problem. So obviously cow wasn't taken as either of those things, the denotation or the connotation. It has to, in this instance, right? It's important to say in this instance, this is, you know, the title of this talk was language in use. In this use, at this time, cow was not taken to be the denotation or the connotation. It looked like an insult to me, uh, but it wasn't taken as an insult. It sends the quite different messages, right? I mean, I've talked about this at length, but you, you know by now, but I'm trying to make it clear the terminology and how to go through the process. It seemed to be something to me like, you're lucky, I'm jealous, right? Uh, and even just the most basic thing was that I like you and you know I like you and I feel comfortable thinking that you like me. So if I call you a cow, you won't take it as either the denotation or the connotation. You'll take it as a sign of that liking that we have, that friendship. We, um, we can safely say things to each other that appear to be horrible, but because we know we won't take them as horrible, they're in fact a positive message here. So in this use, cow shows that we have a close relationship, close enough that we can insult each other. And, and student B, the one who was addressed as cow, her response shows that it was received this way. So that's the process you can go through when thinking about language in use, right? Cow as a term, as a noun, means something. But cow as a bit of discourse includes the co-text, the words around it, and the context, the physical situation. And from the context, the smiles and the easy body language and the obvious comfort. And from the co-text, yeah, my family got iPhones because we got a new plan. It became apparent that in this instant, cow was taken as a positive message of social bonding. So... As you see here, Humpty Dumpty from Alice in Wonderland, uh, Humpty Dumpty has this thing that he said at one point. When I use a word, Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I choose it to mean, neither more nor less. Uh, Alice replies, the question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is, said Humpty Dumpty, which is to be master, that's all. Uh, Linguists agree with Humpty, Mr. Dumpty, here. Uh, people decide what words mean and then interact based on those negotiated meanings of words. Uh, it, it's Non-linguists often think that the dictionary makes up words, sorry, that the dif dictionary decides what words mean and that people must follow. Uh, linguists agree with what we see here. People make up the definitions of words and then dictionaries may follow later. Uh, the dictionary records popular uses of words that are accepted by many people. But the people part comes first. So if everyone starts to use cow to mean something new than what it used to mean, eventually the dictionary, the, the lexicographers, will hear and read this new use, and eventually they'll record it in the dictionary. But that's secondary, right? When people talk to one another and write, but a lot of linguistic innovation first comes through talk, uh, you hear a new word, you don't recognize it, uh, you either ask or you see how it fits into the co-text and the context, and then eventually you understand that new use and then you start using it and it spreads and slowly everyone agrees that this is the new meaning or of course, and it gets recorded in the dictionary or sometimes it spreads only in a limited sense, uh, a limited locale and then it disappears, right? Not every new word becomes established, but the words come from the people first. And so looking at words at, looking at language as discourse, uh, allows us, if we accept that, it makes it much easier to look at language as discourse, to say that we can't just look at grammar and look at dictionaries to see what language means. 
we have to look at people's reactions, look at the context, look at the co-text to understand how language is working at any particular time and place. Uh, we know this, uh, a few examples here, right? Uh, if you read this, you'll see that awful here, it says, comes, I'll pause while you read it for a sec. You see here that it says, awful grace of God, which awful in the meaning that you probably most often encounter is a bad thing. But then to see it with awful grace of God seems unusual because for most people, they're going to think of God as a good thing. Uh, awful power here again, what's going on, right? Uh, well, of course, you see it in the, the root of the word, awful, full of awe, right? Uh, awe was a good thing, typically in the past. Um, how awful goodness is, right? I mean, that the, the devil was full of awe when he encountered goodness. Uh, but of course, now the word is used quite differently uh, in, in a negative way, right? Uh, awful borrowing figures, awful and the uh, co-occurrence with suicidal, which obviously won't be good. Uh, even if you don't know about American football here, you see terrible, bad, which allows you to figure out that awful on 29 passes, okay, also bad. So in the previous examples, awful was a good thing. Now here we see awful is a bad thing. A clear example of how over time language changes uh, and the changes would obviously have to precede any appearance in the dictionary or some of the earlier examples pre-exist dictionaries anyway. The changes have to come through discourse as language in use before they ever get recorded, codified, made into the code is the term you may hear, codified. They have to come first from real language in use, and that's what we're interested in trying to understand as we process language as discourse. Uh, so here what's happened, right? The words have changed almost entirely from one pole to the opposite pole as being a very good thing, a very good thing in the past to a very bad thing now. In fact, it's there's a word for that, as you see here, auto-antonym. You know an antonym is an opposite, right? Big and small. Uh, an auto-antonym, a word has come to mean the opposite of itself, which obviously has to have happened over time through changes in the discourse of that word, changes in the way it's used. Uh, this is actually surprisingly common. Fast is moving quickly, as you know, for Usain Bolt. But of course, fast can be stuck fast is a quite common collocation to mean not moving at all. And now you may not use fast that way, but I'm sure you still are aware of fasten, as it fa sorry, the verb fasten, to fasten something means to stick it so it doesn't move, right? So we have fast as moving quickly and fast as not at all moving, uh, or also you know, the word to fast, to not at all eat, right? Uh, dust is can be remove the dust from something, like we see here, the room must be dusted daily with an oiled or damp cloth, Dust can also be to distribute something loosely, right? Uh, dust the cake with flour, dust the surface with sifted icing sugar, and then knead the almond paste. So, uh, you know, you can end up with something like this. A fast worker will be able to dust the room to clean up the awful mess before the guests arrive. Is this worker stuck fast? Is he or she going to spread mess around the room? Or is he or she going to clean the room uh, and so on for awful? Is it, is it a good mess or a bad mess? Well, it's not hard for you to take this together as a bit of discourse and then use your knowledge of the world and of context and see words like guests. And then, and then you might guess that it's a hotel or, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say a home, but you probably wouldn't say a worker in a home, right? Yeah, that, that it's guests in a hotel. And so the, the worker is going to quickly... Uh, clear the room of dust, and so on, right? So even though these words are auto-antonyms, you can easily piece together what's going on by thinking of this as discourse and that it means something at this time. Well, at this time, fast must mean quick, and dust must mean to remove dust, whereas if it was a baker dusting 
quickly you might think, ah, it's in dusting the icing sugar on top of the cake. <clears throat> Clearly it doesn't mean what I've written here, it means the opposite of this. A word means just what I choose it to mean, says Humpty Dumpty. It's not quite that simple, of course. We don't make up individual meanings ourselves. Others have to accept them. I can't just use a new word or use an existing word with a new definition. That will just confuse people. But that slow spread that can happen as words take on new roles, uh, people accept them collectively choose that the word will have this new meaning. That's really what a linguist thinks, not exactly what Humpty Dumpty says here. So linguists don't read dictionaries. Well, they do read dictionaries, but they don't just read dictionaries. Uh, they listen to people. Uh, what are people saying? What are people writing? And they can even directly ask people is quite common. What did you said this? What did you mean? You said this and she reacted like that. Why did that happen? Uh, it's, it's amazing how often uh, you can ask people about things, and if, you know, if you ask them in a in a an open, friendly, non-judgmental way, make it clear you're not judging them. You say, "I heard you say this. Do you mind if I ask you?" Now, I have an advantage, I think, because I'm obviously don't sound like a British person. So if I say, "Oh, sorry, can you tell me about that word?" and they'll often say, "Oh, yeah. Do you not use it like that in Canada? Do you not use that word, or do you have a different meaning?" But uh, you know, and so they're generally quite accepting to talk about it, but that doesn't mean other people can't do it too, right? You just say, you know, I'm a language student, I'm a language lecturer, I'm interested in language, I haven't heard that before, would you mind telling me? And it's amazing how often people are willing to talk about language because people are generally interested in language. They use it every day, they use it all the time, right? Uh, a very quick example, right? I hear a man in a corner shop one comes in and says to the other, there's no ice here. And it seemed like an odd thing to say just out of the blue from one to the other, but from listening, it turned out that uh, they weren't talking about ice hockey. It turned out from listening and from asking that they weren't talking about, uh, they, that they normally meet each other when they play ice hockey at the rink at Alexandra Palace. Here they've met coincidentally at a different place. One of them says to the other, there's no ice here. And it's taken as a greeting, right? Like, I usually see you where there's ice because I usually only see you at the hockey rink. Now I've met you at this place, but there's no ice. Therefore, jokingly, it doesn't make sense to encounter you here. And so the other, the other person doesn't react by saying, you know, you're right, there is no ice here. He just takes this as a quick summary of all that, that I just said and starts talking, saying something like, oh, yeah, actually, I just live around the corner or something like that. Um, so there's no ice here, it was taken as a greeting at this point, you know, I know you, let's talk. Uh, and instead of just saying hello, he says there's no ice here, which clearly wasn't taken in its denotational meaning, absence of ice, it was taken as, why are you in this place where there's no ice? So we're looking at the purpose of the words, that entire clause, uh, rather than just looking at the meaning of each individual word. Uh, you know, even, I mean, you do that every time you hear, how are you, right? You don't really think of that as a question for the most part. Uh, you may answer, you may answer as if it were a question, how are you? Yeah, fine. But sometimes people just say, how are you? How are you? Right? How are you? Yeah. How are you doing? Uh, like that, right? I mean, the famous British example, how do you do, sounds like a question, but clearly it's just a greeting because from what I understand, the response to how do you do is how do you do, right? How do you do? And at first you may think, how do I do what? But then you realize, ah, it's how do you do, how do you do? And you know, I've probably only heard that about three times in the 15 years I've lived in Britain. It seems like that's uh, dying out. Or I don't know people who say how do you do. Uh, maybe it's associated more with a certain type of person that I don't know. Uh, so that's studying language in use, right? Things don't always mean what they appear to mean at the, at first glance, at the surface level. Uh, I always meet Sharon in her office in the Regent Street building. Suddenly, one time, I see Sharon in the library over on Little Titchfield Street of the university, and I say to her, oh, you look like Sharon. You could pause for a second, 
here and try to explain the steps that I've gone through to make this, right? I mean, it clearly is Sharon, but I say, oh, you look like Sharon. So what have I done here? And as you can figure out whether you paused or not, uh, that I'm saying I look, you look like Sharon is really, again, just a sort of greeting with that extra bit of, you know, why are you here, right? Drawing on the fact that contextually she's in a new place, but usually I meet her in that other place. Therefore, if she's always in the other place, she can't be Sharon, but she sure looks like Sharon. And of course, Sharon doesn't respond by saying, oh, Sean, I am Sharon. Uh, she knows I don't mean that she just looks like Sharon. She's clearly aware of the fact that she is Sharon and that I know it, right? So we negotiate language all the time, right? Unless, unless we're deliberately pretending uh, for, you know, for comic purposes to not understand. She might have said, you know, she might have made a little joke about not being Sharon, but she agrees to play along with me here and accept the fact that my, oh, you look like Sharon should not be taken at face value, should be taken as, why are you here in the library when I always meet you in your office prior to now? Uh, so language in use, studying language in use is the description of language. Let's describe what's going on and explain it. Let's not worry about prescription, right? Let's not talk about what words should mean about how we should do things. There's nothing wrong with prescription at times, right? We need to follow a very prescriptive approach to learn how to speak a new language. You know, this word means this, grammar works like that. But we do have to eventually become more accepting of description that people are very in people are very innovative in the way they use language and they change it to suit their purposes for effect, for comic purposes, to to be obtuse, right? To, to sorry, to obfuscate, right? To not say things directly. Uh, all of that, right, is part of describing how we use language when we don't just follow the basic patterns that we learn from textbooks and so on. Uh, we study in linguistics, we study what people do, we describe what they do, we don't focus on what they should do, which is often the job of a language teacher. Uh, this book here, very well known by Rosina Lippi Green, English with an accent. She writes about many things, but just I'm going to focus here on one idea of that description versus prescription, that describing language as it is rather than what it should be. She gives the example of double negatives. I mean, you can read this other places, but her, her explanation is particularly good. A, a, a prescriptivist will say that a double negative is impossible. I didn't do nothing, or not that it's impossible, but if the, you say I didn't do nothing, uh, this is non-standard, or in truth, as William Sapphire says, he says, in truth, this is a mistake. He says it's wrong because if you didn't say, if you say I didn't do nothing, he says, well, what are you doing? You're doing like in math. Two negatives make a positive in mathematics, right? In maths. Uh, so negative three times negative two equals positive six. So he's arguing, and others like him are arguing, that two negatives in language must also make a positive. So if you say, I didn't do nothing, you're in fact saying, I did do something. You're admitting it, right? Who stole my, who stole my uh, keys? I didn't do nothing. Aha, you stole my keys. Of course not, because most obviously language is not maths. It doesn't matter that two negatives make a positive in maths. Math is not language. Uh, what is being done here, of course, is we know that the person who says I didn't do nothing is not cancelling one negative out with the other, like with mathematics. She or he is doing this emphatically, right, to create a larger meaning than just uh, if you were using a, a standard, you'd say, I did nothing, right? Did you do it? I did nothing. I didn't do nothing, right? Saying it emphatically, you've got the I didn't do anything plus the negative to make it larger here, more, I made it, the, I tried, you know, the font is bigger and the font is green, right? Trying to show that emphatic aspect of saying I didn't do nothing. This is non-standard. Prescriptively, it might be called incorrect, but in terms of 
describing it as discourse. We all know it's emphatic. Uh, William Sapphire, when he says in this kind of thing is a mistake, Libby Green, who wrote the book that I'm talking about now or this part, she says that when people call something non-standard or mistake in the case, she could have added here, she says people often just mean I don't say it and you should follow me, uh, William Sapphire in this case. Or I don't say it, I, Sean Sutherland, don't say I didn't do nothing for the most part, but it doesn't mean that I don't accept it, right? I would be deliberately being, pretending to be stupid if someone said I didn't do nothing and I said, aha, you did it. Uh, I'd be pretending that I don't understand how language really works. And I think that's the problem with someone like Sapphire saying it's a mistake, right? He, I think you can fairly call it non-standard, but to call it a mistake is not accurate because we all know what it means unless we deliberately pretend that we don't understand it. And that, that may be true, right? Some people may deliberately pretend that they don't understand non-standard language because they think poorly of the type of people who use non-standard language, right? Uh, you know, they, they want to say, well, I'm not one of you and I don't even understand people like you. I'm looking over here as if there's someone over here and pointing all the time. There is no one there. Um, this is non-standard language can be more productive, by productive, more useful, more produce, produce more things, right? The famous case in African-American vernacular English, A-A-V-E, uh, this is again in various places, but in Lippy Green's book, you can read about it. The idea of he working, where you have the subject he, and then the gerund form, the ing form, let's say here, rather, he working, meaning he's working right now, right? Where is he? You know, where's Tom? He working. He's at work now. And he be working where you have the subject and then the to be verb, but not conjugated as he is working, just he be working, meaning habitually, right? He's got a job, right? Uh, you know, where where is Tom? He be working. Oh, I see. So he may not be at work now, uh, but he has a job, right? Whereas both of these in standard American English would just be he is working, right? Uh, where is he? He's working. Has he got a job? Yeah, he's working, right? They'd both be he is working. So sometimes uh, it's not just that people change the language to be different, which is certainly possible, right? We like to sound different than others to show our group membership often. It's not just that it's changed to be different here. In fact, it's changed to fill a spot uh, that didn't exist in standard English. This is very common with plural forms of you. English is notoriously weak in the sense that you means one person, right? Can you come here? And you means many people. Can you listen to me, please? And you might be addressing a whole room. And so we have many non-standard forms that are more productive where people in some parts of America say use uh, and or, or you all, can you all listen to me? Uh, sometimes a bit more obscure, like in some, uh, uh, Pittsburgh in the United States and those areas when they say yins, Y, I, N, Z. Here in Britain, of course, you lot, right? Can you lot be quiet? Can you lot help me with this? Because we don't have a, a plural you that's clearly delineated, unlike many languages where there's different words for one you and two or more yous. Um, French, two, one person, and vous, two or more. Uh, so people use non-standard forms to fill that spot and to make it more productive, to make the to make the you more clearly distinguishable one from many people, singular from plural you. Uh, British in it is similarly productive, useful, as we don't need to think about the subject and the verb, right? Uh, normally the process of making a, a tag question in English is quite uh you have to go through a few steps, right? You have to you have to turn the subject into a pronoun, and then you have to reverse the polarity of the verb. So you do something like uh, "it is hot," and then you have to say uh, "it isn't." It is hot, isn't it? The "is" has to become "isn't" like that, right? Or you know, uh, she is. Uh, no, let's use a, a name. Uh, um, Nene is tall, isn't she? The "is." It, is tall has to become isn't and nene has to become she. So you have to go through quite a few steps, right? 
British init non-standard, but very useful to just be able to say in it at the end of anything, right? It's hot in it, uh, she's tall in it, let's go in it. I mean, I've heard it in all kinds of uses like those, right? Uh, much simpler than having to go through the process, just tag in it on the end. It's non-standard, but descriptively it's uh, very useful. We can say even that when people use enough of these forms, these non-standard forms, remember I'm not using non-standard to be bad in any way, just dis different from standard, but uh, clearly following rules, right? He working and he be working was not random. Sometimes one use clearly meant this, one use clearly meant that, right? Uh, we can even call them sometimes in linguistics an anti language, right? That it's language used to, not anti as in it's not language, but anti as in to show that opposition between my group and your group. It, we often find in languages people like to use language similarly enough to others to be understood. It's useful if I can communicate in English with people all over the world. Wonderful. But we also like to show a bit of difference to show some sort of delineation between my group and your group. I'm glad I can talk to your group but I'm clearly part of this group because I talk like this. I say I didn't do nothing. People like me say I didn't do nothing. I learn from people who say I didn't do nothing. I like people who say I didn't do nothing. So I talk like them. It's not hard for you and your group to understand me, but your group doesn't really say it that way. So it shows that we're, you know, we get along, we understand each other, but we got some differences too, right? This is no different than people aligning themselves with various groups in terms of their clothing, in terms of their hairstyles, right? We have various ways of showing group membership. Uh, language does the same. Uh, examples of this sort of inclusion versus exclusion. Uh, I seem to have done that slime twice, sorry. Things like famously in London Cockney rhyming slang, uh, which clearly identifies the user as a certain type of person, especially in the past when it was really strongly used, less so now, but it still shows you as a, you know, British person, maybe even a Londoner to use Cockney rhyming slang. Prisons are well known for doing this. The prisoners want to talk amongst themselves of the guards understanding the language of prisons famously changes quickly because as soon as the guards know words that the prisoners use, the prisoners have to change them again in order to continue to talk about things without the guards hearing them. Uh, CB radio are the CB, those those radios, the old days pre-internet where, uh, especially in vehicles, people would use CB. CB stands for citizens band, but that doesn't matter. A kind of radio where you could talk to other people near you on an open frequency. So people driving could talk about things, either just chatting about the weather, but also to talk about the police, right? Truck drivers were said to use them to talk about the police, to give warnings, you know, don't drive too fast through this town because the police have set up a speed trap or something. Hip hop, right? So much hip hop is impenetrable in, linguistically at first in, uh, because they're using the language to signal that group membership, right? We hip hoppers are like this in the way we dress and in the way we use language. And then the fans become part of the group as they learn to understand the language used, right? It's a joining of members uh, identifying with the language. And uh, a well-known example from Britain has to do, it's called you English versus non-you English. We don't hear this term so much in daily use, but you'll encounter it in uh, texts on linguistics as a real example of language identifying group members and excluding others. Uh, you see it in the title of this, Alice Through the Looking Glass, the second of the, uh, earlier I mentioned Alice in Wonderland, now we're at Alice Through the Looking Glass. This looking glass, when I was younger, I didn't understand what it meant. I pictured it was some sort of thing for looking, right? Like a telescope. Uh, you may know that in fact, what a looking glass meant at the time, it's not used so commonly now, was a mirror. It just meant mirror, through the looking glass. She stepped through the mirror. Uh, there are apparently places in London, especially some of the rich places, where uh, where if you go into a shop, they will ask you something. These are those expensive shops where uh, you, you may have seen them down Sloan Street or something where the there will be someone near the door with uh, glasses that have uh, either juice or water or champagne and they'll offer you a drink as you come in. 
and they don't care even if you take the champagne because you know one pair of shoes is 400 pounds right and you have to be careful right because sometimes a glass means the glass but at other times the glass means the mirror so if you're trying on one of these expensive uh, shirts and they say would you like a glass and you have to be careful to distinguish oh they're offering me a mirror if you say yes i'll have a glass and reach for the glass of juice uh they'll be like oh you know she he can't afford to shop here right doesn't even understand the language of posh people like those who are usually here uh a looking glass is a mirror uh even just a glass right is sometimes referred to as a glass okay wrapping up right so uh here's a here's a useful uh definition all in one text all in, sorry all in one quotation that summarizes the difference between t language as discourse versus just thinking of language as the text itself by the text i mean the words on the page right discourse is thus a more embracing term that calls attention to the situated uses of text you've got the text the words but they're situated they're at a certain time uh at, time matters right glass used to be mirror now mirror is mirror but people bring that back to play on that idea of what it meant in the past right situated in time and place right things mean something specific at a certain time in a certain place so it's not just the words you have to think of the situation in which those words are used as they continue here it comprises it meaning discourse discourse comprises both text and context you've got the words and where and when those words are used always remember context means context of place and context of time people usually think of context as meaning where are you you have to always remember the when are you matters too uh this is my own summary of what i just said right you can only understand the discourse correctly if you think of it as part of whatever context of time and place it is in at the moment Can you make sense of this interaction as a text without knowing more about the context? You hear a person say something like this. Sorry, where's the entrance? I guess I shouldn't go past them. Thank you. You could probably puzzle something out about what might be meant here, but without the actual context, you'll never know exactly, right? I mean, what's happened is someone has walked up to a doorway, but the doorway is at the moment blocked and it, by a guard rails because there's some construction some building works being done so the person walks up sees a, a builder there uh, and says sorry where's the entrance obviously not this entrance this says entrance but obviously this isn't the entrance now right because it's blocked sorry where's the entrance i guess i shouldn't go past them them the uh, pillars bollards blocking the entrance uh and then the person says thank you which doesn't seem to have any connection except if you saw the context you know as i saw it that the builder was on the telephone so a person comes up and says sorry as in i apologize for interrupting you while you're on the telephone where's the entrance i guess i shouldn't go past them the builder says and i don't know if you can see my hand points around the corner so the person continues thank you so it's a successful interaction that is only interpretable you can only understand it fully by having seen the place and the time at which it occurred uh, a sillier example but equally relevant right what does this mean uh this here would depend on the pronunciation well rather not the pronunciation the stress where do you put the stress do you say they fed her dog meat or they fed her dog meat uh those are quite different meanings right they fed her dog meat or they fed her dog meat one sounds reasonably acceptable the other one doesn't right in summary this right we're not going to just think about what words mean but we're also going to think about what they do their purpose right was the cow an insult or a sign of friendship we're not going to think descriptive we're not going to think prescriptively about what people should be doing but we're going to think descriptively about making sense of what they are doing and not fussing about trying to correct them but rather focusing on the novel innovative ways that people use language when they use it in real time language in use good thank you very much